Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Dark Matters Podcast. I am Jay Austin Yoshino. I am your host. I'm also the editor-in-chief of Fresh Fall Magazine. This is my illustrious, lovely, competent, talented rock star co-host, Marguerite Hill. She is the co-founder and executive director of Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative. They are a, an organization dedicated to anti-racism and anti-racism competency training. I have taken the training. It has changed my life. They are also a co-sponsor of this podcast. Welcome, Marguerite. How are you doing on this lovely Saturday? I'm doing a little storm prep. Hurricane is um, a tropical storm hitting Southern California. So I think this is the first time historically we've had that warning. So, um, yeah, I think it was 80 years ago was the last hurricane. So global warming. Wow. I, it, 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 yeah, I, I remember you seem to remember you mentioning a drill. Or were you like going to drill some boards onto your windows or something? Uh, no. Um, you know, I, but I was looking at power tools. Um, <laughs> I was just in Lowe's and got really excited. I was actually more excited about the smoker, but looking at power tools, it can, you know, make you feel a little bit like more powerful purposeful, than what you are. Right? Purposeful, <laughs> even if you don't know how to use them correctly. So <laughs> I, I want to mention to everybody before we get started to, um, if you're, especially if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're, or if you're watching a recording of this, please like, share, and subscribe. Um, you know, this this effort is is not free. We we could use your help and your support in getting this thing moving forward a bit more. Um, and yeah, so that's what I have for. I'm, I'm going to mention it again at the at the end of the hour. So we're going to talk about foundation today. I want to remind people that we are going to talk about Ahsoka next week because it comes out on the 23rd, um, which I'm excited about. And we will discuss that. But I wanted to start with our this week's science roundup, which is the uh, the first article was there's a couple of topics I wanted to cover, but the first one was about um, the WHO's medicinal uh, traditional medicine summit. And while I I like that concept, it's been criticized number one, heavily criticized by the medical industry. Um, I like that concept, but given that given the, D, the WHO's sort of diminished status um, as a result of the pandemic and such, I'm I'm sort of skeptical of the treatment of that. But I'm glad they're doing it. Uh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about about uh, either the summit itself or the criticism that it's apparently incurred. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think. Um. I I guess like I'll focus on like. The, the critique of traditional medicine, um, which I do get that there, there are some herbs, herbs that we don't know, like the, the efficacy, or they may have side effects that haven't been tested. Uh, however, a lo- most of our medicines that we have, like, right, like come from traditional cures, like people are actually um, that there are, are people that do try to discover different compounds in tropical rainforests or in this different thing, you know, like there, there is that kind of, there is that industry, but yet when it comes to, um, looking at what have people traditionally done to relieve ailments, um, that dismissal, um, in place of like, medicines that can have like really hardcore like the side effects um i think that that diminishes it but what my big concern right is like when there is that discovery that there's a traditional cure or traditional um treatment that when pharmaceuticals get a hold of that and when they monopolize that even though they've taken the treatment from indigenous peoples that's when it's really harmful. And when they, when they deny treatment to individuals, right, there are certain treatments when it saves lives, like that should be available. It shouldn't have a cost to, to the population. So that's kind of my, my concern um, as far as having a summit where there may be that discovery, right. Or they, they put it through the system of testing and then they make it inaccessible to um, the people that they've, um, ripped it off from 
Yeah, I 100% agree about that. And, and I think, you know, even following on the tail of this, our discussion about Henry de Lacks is this idea of intellectual property, you know, because, you know, like how much are you entitled to basically profit from a discovery that's not really your own? And, and to what degree should not only, well, first of all, total care should be taken in the cultivation and extraction of it. Like it should never be extractive or exploitative. But if you're going to do it, then then these pharma companies should 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 form partnerships with these local communities in order to understand its traditional use and then chart ways for future use, and also give those communities a say in how it's manufactured, distributed. Because you know every you know the two biggest drugs in existence right now, opioids and and uh, um, cocaoids, whatever coke anyway, cocaine essentially, cacao those two things came from plants, right? And those things have had an absolutely devastating effect on on modern civilization. Yeah, I went through that too, but really like filtered through that, that process, right? And um, yeah, what you're saying about opioids, that's, that's, it's so interesting when you think about just even like wars were fought over that, you know, like the Chinese, like, cause like the op opium wars. So, um, yeah, I mean, even like with wellness, right? Like a lot of the wellness um, is just cultural appropriation around um, East Asian and and um, you know like East Asian practices and like Hindu practices. <laughs> like it's just like the yo yoga, as you know, like it's it's by just my, um, by my my Ayurvedic insert product here. Yes. Um, I, you know, it's it's funny too because I think there's also this element of there are two elements that I kind of want to, I want to you know mention with regards to this topic. Number one, you know, people have been getting along and and surviving for thousands of years before big pharma and and hospitals arrived, which is not to say that they don't have their place in 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 human wellness. It's that we have we have an over reliance on it, right? It's like you get a cough and you're going to get a shot or you're going to get an antibiotic, which obviously has its own you know, deleterious effects. We're we're creating super bugs because these bugs are getting resistance to strains, et cetera. Um, but also, I think that we need to go back to a, 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 a. There are some things that we know are efficacious that we can use. The other thing that that kind of bothers me is where were these people who are critical of these these methods? Where were these people during the pandemic? Right. You're you're asking us to 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 forego what they call traditional medicine or traditional methods of of alleviating let's just say non-life-threatening, you know, like minor pain, et cetera. They're, they're being critical of that. And, but the truth is that you, you guys did, you guys dropped the ball when it counted most. So it's like you're asking us to now trust you. And I'm not saying, and by the way, I'm not saying don't trust the science. Trust the science. What I'm saying is that people allow the science to be politicized too much. And they, they exceeded too much to pressure from the right to say, oh, it's this or, oh, it's that. No, it's it, we're still in the middle of it. So... I think that that's really, those two things are really kind of important. Yeah, I mean, the, the politics, like, um, I'm not sure if it's like with who had politicized it, but I mean that that when you had a political movement that has eroded trust in institutions. Sure. And, um, you know, and then so with that, I mean, there it did bend to some, you know, to the pressure of not, you know, really standing up to that. Um, however, the just the right is just politicize everything, just teaching truth, you know, <laughs> like so sure. it's just like then it becomes now we seem partisan. Right. If we're trying to um, teach facts like this is how it's transmitted, that you know, these people that are having heart attacks are not, it's not because they took um, a, a vaccine, but it's because of these other conditions, but yet, you know, so it's like when the truth becomes partisan, then, you know, it's, it's, Agreed. it's so, Agreed. so difficult. And, and also you know, when difficult. you, when you sort of lift, when you sort of lift protections in favor of, of economic gain, I think that's, yeah. you know, but yeah, I, I think I guess the point that I'm making is that there, you know, it, it, there's a double standard at play here where I think that people, as with most other issues, I think that a lot of the things that we 
we, we do need to begin to reinstill a sense of trust in our communities when it comes to what they call traditional medicine. And I'm not saying that, again, you know, you, you broke your leg and your bone is sticking through your skin and you're like, hey, let me put a let me wrap a leaf on it. Like, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, I do want to point to a very notable herbalist, uh, Emma Dupree, who was, I believe, from South Carolina, North Carolina. But she was a well-known herbalist. Her work is being studied by universities, which, by the way, her research and a lot of her the footage of her is only available at, I think, the Duke University website. And I think that that's kind of a shame because her work was public, and so her legacy should also therefore be public and not controlled by a, by a private institution. But people should look her up. There's a book. There's a book of her herbal remedies and cures and stuff out there. People should have a look. Always good to pair something like that with things like foraging. Also, I'm gonna. You know, I have to get that in there. So good stuff. let's let's. You know, I mean, I think. Well, when it comes to some of the the traditional like like medicine or even like the wellness, like there's a woo woo factor, right? Like where you have the placebo effect that's happening, but then there's like the holistic approach to to medicine where they're talking about like the mind, the body, um, even like the spirit and how that all is like you know having that integrated self, and so. Um, you know, yeah, we should have some evidence base. Like I'm all for like looking at sure. the science and stuff. Cause like some of that woo woo stuff is like, it could actually cause harm. You know, we don't know yes. what's in some of those compounds. <laughs> like, it's like if True. it's never been True. tested or, um, you know, and then other things that could cause environmental harm. Like, you know, I mean, if we're, you know, trying to get Roundup Rhino things. So it's like, I'm all for, you know, like, oh, hey, yes. you gotta I... make sure. <laughs> yeah, things like that. I definitely, but I mean, I'm. I guess I'm thinking too of like major will. You know, like, you know, like Tolkien didn't just make that up. That's actually a thing that people use because it's, it's a coagulant and uh, and an analgesic. You know, so like everything that I'm I'm a proponent of when I say, hey, I'm not saying screw modern medicine. Let's just all go herbal. That's not that's not a good idea. All I'm saying is that that. Rather than kind of taking the one of the extreme approaches, we take a measured approach to the reintroduction of of traditional medicines into our into our our communities, you know. And and obviously, you know, yeah, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying let's let's de democratic degrowth, let's destroy hospitals. No, I'm for universal health care. Um, so yes, I agree with you. Um, I, I I wanted to also take us to our next topic, which was about millet right there was an article in um asahi shimbun maybe it was japan times um this is asahi shimbun that talks about i i curate a lot of my science articles by the way from, from japanese publications because they tend to have better science reporting than american publications do um but there is a an article about how millet as a crop will help people navigate tr climate change um because it grows better, it grows very well in arid regions. I would like your take on that too. I mean, uh, millet. Every time I think about millet, I think about the bird food we have to. Like when we had cocktails, and and it's not. I don't have very fond memories of the smell. It doesn't seem appetizing to me. But I also know that like it's just like. That there are some societies that eat millet, but then I just think about bird food, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like that's just so so oh, so wait rough. To cook it. Um, Good lord. So so yeah, that's oh, and it's like maybe millet. You should make westerners in arid regions. Oh god, and I'm I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move because I live in an arid region, and um, yeah, or we could sell it at um. At, as superfood at Erewhon, and um, you know, I just was by there last <laughs> last week, but I didn't go in because I, you know, I didn't want to spend twenty dollars on a on a on a drink. Um, Ayurvedic millet. So, but next time I'll go to Erewhon. Yeah, it's an Ayurvedic millet. Maybe rub it on something too. To the the, the heal thing my that shoulder. struck me about this article too was how there are all these articles that are designed to convince you. Like there is a bit by. Um, by a comedian who talked about how they don't cure anything anymore. 
they just figure out ways for you to live with it, right? Because there's no money in the cure, right? Because once you're cured, you know, and I feel like they're doing the same thing with climate change. They're simply trying to, to tell us ways, like they're basically saying, hey, you know what? We're not going to stop polluting and profiting and exploiting the environment. So here are five ways for you to avoid dying once sea levels arise 10 feet. You know, like that's that was the tone of the article for me. Like, um, yeah, that was like how I took that from the article. But then also yeah. the biggest producers of millet in the world, surpri are, unsurprisingly, are India and several countries in Africa, including Niger and Nigeria, right? As if Niger didn't already have problems with exploitation. It's like, hey, let's get all of our uranium and millet needs met by invading a country that's basically throwing off the yoke of oppression. So once again, I feel like, you know, Western powers are looking at or they're eyeballing the global south for even like their post climate change food needs right it's like they're not even waiting they're like already circling like buzzards yeah and they want to limit the people to that right they were like well you know we, we really want your industry like an industry that is just that we can exploit which actually accelerates the 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 climate change for them locally like when when their um, ecosystem is like it's sapped out, and and part of part of the the biggest problem that we have and that creates instability in places like Africa is that that we have borders, modern borders where people used to be able to migrate. So you had a lot of pastoral nomads in communities that would transcend national borders and and migrate, and you know like that that was something that allowed the soil to replenish itself, um, allowed them to be, whether they're, if they're pastoral nomads, to, um, you know, to move their herds in places of like brighter pastures and then come back. And, it, you know, so they had nat more natural cycles. But when you are forcing people to be in one place and, and when you criminalize migration, so which comes on, you know, we'll have that in the theme, right, where people like where you have migrants that come to Trantor and like, what does that look like when you're on the outer rim and come in, um, into yes. the, to the center? Enjoy but, my um, peace. Yeah. So it is, it is definitely, I mean, the, the conditions that we have, like the migrant crisis is a crisis because we've criminalized it and um, we fixed borders that don't work naturally with, um, with both like the climate, not just the climate, but just like the patterns of like how humans have historically lived, which is like moving about. And so, yeah, we're seeing that, that harm, but yet what they want is to like fix the people there to say like, no, you're going to be producers to serve us. Right. And, and however like miserable your life is, as you serve the global North, that's, you know, and it's really becoming sort of a, you're right. It's really becoming sort of a monolith in that you're forcing subs you know, people into subsistence farming so that you can feed people who are subsistence laborers in other fields. Right. So this millet story was a little, you know, was a little it's like I they, do they actually think that they're publishing a feel good story? Because I don't feel good when I read that. Yeah. What I see is exactly what you pointed out was this perpetuation of these the criminalization of, of of migrant dynamics while simultaneously forcing people into a level of subsistence. And and I'm not saying that millet is a subsistence crop, but I know that that okay. early American early American enslaved ate millet primarily, my understanding. So well there's a lot of millet around at those times. So and I know I believe they fed millet to enslaved people as they were being transported. So I think that there's like there's kind of a lack of sensitivity there in this assertion, even though I know that it's still eaten widely in Africa. And by the way, I had a neighbor who used to cook millet and like I could smell it and it did not smell great when it was cooking. But man, when you get it with some Nigerian dishes, it's delicious. So um, anyway, it's just it's not even bad smelling. It's just very, it's very overpowering. Like it's yeah. hard to study when you have that going on in your apartment. Um <laughs> So, sure it's like, so yeah, I had some Nigerian dishes with millet because I was just like, oh, yeah, like I personally do not know any good recipes for millet. So I'm, you know, but I, I've 
gone to some very strange, not strange, but it's like, I, I could not imagine me like quinoa, like these superfoods that we're eating, right? To get yeah, um, quinoa, um, hemp seeds, like the things that we see in like health food stores. It's It's like, you know, these were the traditional foods that people ate. And subsistence farming is is not necessarily a bad thing. It's like it's where um, it's when people have to actually like they're not able to garden and to to create like grow their own foods. Um, that is a real big problem. And that's what I have a deep concern about is like when you have industrial farming and when places where they're just like they want to optimize it for one crop. So the monocrop thing is actually really driving a lot of environmental degradation. Yes. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I agree that subsistence farming is not, not, not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, traditionally it's been a good thing. I guess the thing that I'm point, I was trying to point out is how it is conducted in modern times, you know, which, um, which is, again, it's extractive and very frequently, um, people are, aren't necessarily doing it out of choice, right? It's like de-urbanization, right? It's like you have to do it because you have no choice, um, which is not always the case, but in America, it, it can often be. Um, anyway, so yes, I so yeah, I 100% agree. I wanted to correct myself. You were correct. Subsistence farming does not necessarily connote something negative or evil. Um, but but so that's our... like that one crop that has like, a lot of calories, but little nutrients. And so that's what maize did in Africa. So a little historical thing when, when maize was brought, like when it became prom like, like introduced in Africa, like, and that they used that to feed a lot of people, um, that it actually caused famine because, you know, there is like that initial calorie surge and, then there's like overpopulation and but yet it's it doesn't have nutrients like when you diversify the food and even like with foraging or things that people could do to grow multiple you know like just um like gardening finding different items but but like maize is just calorie rich nutrient poor and then um you know once the climate changes if there's a slight shift then you have mass starvation so that is a problem when, when you have people that are thinking about industrial farming as opposed to being like, well, how can we create systems, right, where you can, that, that allow people to, um, to get all the nutrients that they need, right, and, and the variety of foods that they need. So, yeah, we, we have a, a lot of... Reminder that that actually, dynamic that you just pointed out actually happened in the United States in the early 20th century. Right. The United States, they were they didn't use crop rotation methods. They were using monocrops. And what that did was it leached nutrients out of the soil instead of returning them to the soil. And over time, uh, you know, the, the top layer of soil desiccated, became dust. And by the way, crop planting also affects weather patterns. So you had this giant, massive, these giant, massive storms in the Midwest um, that killed that killed a lot of people. Um, and by the way, the person who who helped solve that problem, George Washington Carver, actually got a Presidential Medal of Freedom and was widely hailed by Roosevelt as the person who essentially saved America from starvation. So, um, and he introduced um, a method of uh, methods of crop uh, planting that had been in use for thousands of years. Right? It's just that. Because of industrialization, people were like, "No, I'm gonna plant. I'm gonna plant just potatoes, or just corn, or just whatever." So I wanted to get a little bit of Black history factoid in there, real quick. Thank you. Now I'll add a little bit of um, uh, Native American. Um, so we, when we put that all together, we we have we have some major, um, like just. Not just magic, because we're not talking about the woo-woo, but scientific things, <laughs> but like the three sisters. So, but this actually comes from when I taught at uh, the Muslim youth camp, and one of my students for my public narrative class, he actually was um, had take. He was from Texas, so he had taken, um, and he was probably about ten years old, and he, this young man, is so 
fascinating. Like he is just so like of creating ecological, like create diversity, right? And diver and um and so he talked about the three sisters, which are that's like the um squash, um, a, um squash, corn and beans. And so that fixes nutrients into the soil and allows it to continue. So interesting. In George Washington Carver and Native and Native American um, methods of planting the rotation through the year, um, that that actually allowed um, for in the ecological diversity, the diversity of like whether we're taking like heritage seeds and not just getting genetically modified seeds of one type of seed growing. So th these are the types of things. So I'm all for like, as we think about traditional um, medicine, yes. we need to think about traditional ways of farming and food systems that yes. fit in not just in kind of like herbal, like not urban, urban environments where food systems are actually falling short, where it can lead to mass starvation once systems yes. fall apart. So. I was, I'm, I'm so glad you said that. You're right. Those things are connected and, and really what it, points to is democratic degrowth, which I think we touched upon mm -hmm. in a previous episode, which is the idea that, that we have to stop industrializing all of our consumer needs and we have to start deindustrializing. And a good example of that is, is, is our meat, our meat consumption, right? Because we waste something like a billion, million tons of meat every year that doesn't get sold. And we need to go back to like local butchers, you know, and local mm -hmm. like meat farms and that sort of thing. If that is, if, if meat is your thing anyway. So so that was a great science roundup. I, you know, I couldn't find anything for like nerd roundup. And one of the things that occurred to me is I used to like Fresh Pulp magazine is partially modeled off of this sort of pop culture nerd magazine from the early 2000s, late, late, late 20th, early 2000s. And I realized that when they went out of business, I think like 15 years ago, well, they didn't really go out of business. They just switched their model from like a pop culture magazine to selling plushy toys. But I realized once they did that, that there was this giant hole in the market for like nerd, for what I call nerd culture, because they, they had like their, their curation was just, in, it was, it was wonderful. And so I realized now that I'm just going to have to get really serious about getting down in the dirt, finding more nerd topics for us to discuss. So for the time being, we're going to have to move on to foundation um, and talk a bit about that but i will i am working on it so trust me we will have we will have some stuff coming up so foundation we are they have I, i'm just going to start calling it double down right just double down because they're just they just keep they just keep doubling down on these bad tropes oh um, gosh yeah i mean well let's do the play-by-play -play and then because i feel like you, you do such a good Roundup. So I, I like, really like. I had to like watch. Like, I was like, "What did happen? What did I watch the other day?" Because so most of the story this time w focused on Gale and Savor and Harry, and they're on Ignis. And and in the last episode, they went to Ignis, and as, as it turns out, there's a planet of basically of telepaths, people who have who have fled their 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 civilizations to go and live on this on Ignis. And once again, Harry was deceptive because he knew about their existence and had hoped to turn them kind of into the second foundation. And he kept something else that he kept from Gale and Salvo. So they're now on this planet and, and they are, they're not really, they're, they're, I mean, I, I will say they're not really prisoners and the inhabitants aren't necessarily hostile to them, but there is a lot of, telepathic subterfuge going on on the planet so harry basically um the the leader and i forget her name the leader or woman of the telepaths basically tries to convince gail that she needs to sort of get rid of harry and that they need that that she can lead their community if she does um harry basically interjects there's this like argument and then he runs off which is bizarre and it turns out that he had really run off they just telepathically made her look made it look like he had and then made it look like he'd gotten in the ship, the, the beggar, and like taken off and just left. So then we get a flashback of Harry, uh, Harry's life when he was working at Streeling University, right? He's a kid, 
and then like he you know grows up and he does all this um you know he starts working on psych you know psychohistory and he meets yana who ends who is his wife who ends up being his wife and they create the prime radiant together and then once the, his research kind of becomes well known the empire steps in and is like hey we want to offer you a position on trantor at Sterling university um but you have to kind of make up your mind now. And the administrator of the university doesn't really like him. So, cause he, she's like, you, he thinks he's just kind of, you know, abrasive and stuff. And he and Yana kind of have a disagreement about going to Trantor. And he's like, I'm not going to Trantor, screw the empire and whatever, which I immediately was like, that's really dangerous. Anyway. So then going back to, um, to there's a brief sec. There are two brief segments with brother constant and the other dude where they go to, they they take the the, the jump uh, ships to Trantor. They check in. They go through customs. I was like, when Harry both first assigned them that mission, I was like, that's a death mission. Like they're going to show up and they're going to be immediately killed. Anyway, so they get through uh, through customs and they basically kind of hang out in on you know on on the planet and go to different places and stuff and then they go to their hotel. And then there's a scene with Hober Mallow and he's like taking his 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 ship his jump ship to the far reaches, whatever these coordinates are. And this giant crazy ship shows up out of nowhere and like docks at this ship going back to Ignis. Basically um, uh, it turns out that Harry not only did storm out of that conversation and leave, he's been staked down in a little lagoon, right. And waiting for the tides to come in, he's going to be killed, right. The woman who woman captured him and is now dr- going to drown him. And while he's drowning, he has like more flashbacks about Yana and, and she's reading his mind. She's this, I'm not going to get into that yet. Anyway. So, and he dies. Sorry. Spoiler. He dies. Um, but Gail is Gail. One of the things that the, that the leader asserts is that Gail should not be working, not only working with Harry because Harry is her is not her better. He's, He's her inferior. He should be her subordinate, which I agree with. But on the same hand, she's just kind of being tossed about. Salvor and Harry do have a conversation, which didn't really amount to much. So this was like a really kind of a filler episode. It did move the story, but it was, there wasn't a lot going on. So um, so the, basically that episode ends with basically Harry dying. So um, anyway, if, if I miss something, let me know, please, because I know I... I'd probably trim. Uh, I mean, well, you got the mo- like where the imp- like empire or the lady that went oh, to right. get, like she kills Harry's wife. She kills Harry's wife. That's right. I'm sorry. That was a big. That yeah. was a big. It was a big point because it kind of informs like why he is the way he is. But yeah, that the woman who is the administrator of the college abducts Harry's wife to get him to give her the prime radiant, but he ends. Up, she ends up killing him, killing her, killing the wife. And by the way, her, his wife was pregnant at the time. And, and she, when she found out she was pregnant, she gave him a, a medallion that looks like the vault. The vault is modeled after the medallion, right? The medallion has a heartbeat in it, and it tells Harry he can, so that the, the heartbeat of the child and her can be next to him. And so when she, when the when the, the administrator comes and says, I, I took your wife hostage, but if you give me the prime radiant, I'll let her go. He's like, I already know she's dead, man, because of the, her heartbeat stopped beating, right? Like, whatever yesterday or whatever and so he basically takes her out to like the desert and lets these animals kill her so um which is by the way that's significant I, again i'm sorry i'm butchering this but in the very beginning of the episode which is like a flashback he's like a little boy and he notices visually that the, 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 there are these animals these winged animals that kind of run through this particular area the valley and then fly up to the to um helicon's moon Right, which shares Helicon's atmosphere, and he notices that there was a pattern to how they would run, and he ran went out into the middle of the stampede and just stood there, and they ran around him because he knew where to stand. And so he does the same thing when he abducts the woman; he takes her out to this where these things stampede. He stands there and he holds her with him, and then shoves her into the into into the stampede. She dies, so he gets revenge on her. Um, so yeah, that's that's. You know, again, if I'm missing anything else, because I, you know, anyway. Yeah, there's a lot of little things. A lot of little, lot of little things, which, which um, I'm sure will come out through the course of the discussion. Yeah. So if you'd like, if, if you want to kick it off, you're more than welcome to. 
Yeah, I mean, well, let's just kick it off. Like, I mean, if you can control people's minds, right, and you wanted to take them out, would you go through all the elaborate things of drowning somebody as, like, kind of death? Or would you find another cool, metallic way of killing somebody? So I'm a little bit skeptical about the water death, maybe, or maybe he saw it, or... But I just want to, I'm like, maybe there's something else behind this. Because if I was a mentalic, like, I'd just be like, you're just going to think you're walking. You fall off a cliff. Make it easy. You know, like, it's just like, you're right. just walking and you just fall. Like, there's so many ways, right? Like, you could die. But, like, that was just way too complicated. That's a good point. For That's what? Point. For no reason. For no reason. That's a good point. Ocean I think death, also, like, it, it, it also probably presents more questions than it solves like if they find his body they're gonna be like well he didn't fall off a cliff you know and he, he but the, the, the fact that they show that they projected... he could have given him a heart attack you know what i'm saying like it's not young i mean even though like they could have just been like oh he just he just failure to thrive you well know? to me part of the point wasn't just to murder him part of the point was to discover the location of the prime radiant and so i think they, she staked him down in that little lagoon so that she could mm. probe, probe his mind as he was dying, you know, to like maybe glean something. That's what I thought, but I wasn't 100% sure. Um, but yeah, there, you're right. There is a, that element is a little overly complicated. Yeah, well, Gail has the water thing. So that would have made more sense to have Gail like, okay, we're trying to get you to like agree to something. So we're going to do that. But like, what was... <laughs> Harry's thing, a stampede of buffalo or something, you know? I mean, that, right. I we mean, had... the buffalo scene just reminded me of Lion King. I'm not going to lie, you know? So it's just like. <laughs> it went, we, and it's funny because she splashed her. This is the thing about the leader of the telepaths, the mentalics. First of all, I don't like her, okay? Because she is one of these people. And, and look, I get the community. The community is a community of people who've been traumatized and ostracized. But I also do not think that that being traumatized and ostracized gives you the right to act in the in in. in she was very evil. Some of the things that she did mm -hmm. were, were patently evil, and she yeah. was unapologetic about that. Like she was like, "I'm just going to splash you in the face with water and then go into your mind." And there's also this issue of consent. Again, this issue of consent. This idea of not only entering people's minds to take information, but entering their minds to adjust or alter their realities. That is incredibly evil or immoral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. It's a um, deep violation. One of the things that I was thinking about, which is of it's, is the, um, the way she talked about humans who didn't have the ability that they weren't real complete. people. Like, yeah, they're right. not complete. So therefore their deaths don't matter. Like I'm not killing you because you're not one of us. So that's yeah. you, you um, Genesis. Yes. Yeah. So it's a very uh, deep, deep concern. So it's, um, so, I mean, you're right to be suspicious about whenever you see some scenes where everybody's wearing all white and you're just like, wait, is this a cult? Is this something, a kind of this conformity that you're seeing there? Um, and that um, her assumption that Gail should be the leader, like does Gail have have what what it takes that that um, it's because it's not just a touch of evil, it's just a ruthlessness. You know, yeah, just does Gail have that ruthlessness to keep that community, or just like that Tellum's image of like how she's going to protect our community? Like, so why does she pick? Gail to be that person is my concern because um, I mean I haven't seen like I mean Gail has a little bit of a temper there and has inadvertently done some stuff um, like torture the um, is it Radiant wherever he was at right. you Tor know torture like, Harry torture Harry's consciousness in the Prime Radiant yeah Harry's con but is that really his consciousness? That's a good question. That really That's a good question. But another familiar. good question is, and you you touched upon this, but is the person who is being drowned, even if it, if even if it is being drowned, that's not Harry's original body, and so we don't know. We don't know if drowning will necessarily work on that body. It may be cloned. It may be an android body. For all we know, we don't know. 
Yeah, and there's another Harry somewhere else. Right? Also similarly so, evil. Yes. Yeah, I mean, but he was even more, I mean, maybe like embodied Harry was, but no, I mean, for him to do that torture thing with the with that one lady. But can we just get to to what we may really want to say, which may keep us from having a, um, a good follower, follower group, but I'm just going to say it. Like when they de-aged Harry, they put that terrible wig on him and he looked just as bad in his youth as he looked in his old age. And <laughs> here is this beautiful brown woman that's brilliant, who could have been with anybody else. And he just had no, he had no um, riz. Like his charisma was just absolutely deplorable. And I see this. This follows a pattern that I see. Because I may mean, not, given that, I mean, I'm Muslim American, I see, I, I mean, I engage with a lot of um, South Asian Arab women. And, and sometimes I'm just like, that's who you picked, you know, like their, their partners of choice are just like, no riz, you know, like, I mean, and, and. And I was just like, you know, or just like very little to offer. Like, you're just like, I mean, it's one thing is like not to say that love, you know, I mean, I believe love is love, like when you fall in love with someone. But but I was just like, OK, for I know that they were they're still trying to play up. He's a nerd. But like, why? Like, why was she so beautiful and he's so horrendous? Like young Harry, Harry was horrendous. I'm, I'm not going to lie. That entered my mind also. And here's the thing, because, and, I, and by the way, 100% agree. You're so followers be damned. Well, not really, but we hope you still follow us. But if you want, if you want, if you want unfiltered takes, this is where you got to come. Um, yeah. Well, not well, totally. Let me look at the partially. actor. What did he look like when he was younger? Because J- that... Jared Harris. He, I mean, yeah. he's looked like that since Mad Men. So I, I, he, he was in the original Lost in Space <laughs> movie, and even then he was not. He was no. He was no like prize. But and the thing is that obviously, <laughs> obviously we can't go. You're right. We, you're right. We can't go entirely on looks, right? Obviously, what they're trying to put forth is this idea that it's his brilliance that attracts her. But the thing that that I find particularly egregious about that is the fact that she's every bit if not more brilliant right and also you're never going to find some two people who are equally brilliant that's never going to happen but i feel like she had a more holistic view of what of, of what they were trying to accomplish where he was very he was very narrow-minded and actually to a degree narcissistic and so you have a woman like that who is who is I, i'm trying to think of a good word for her she was very she was clearly hyper intelligent. She was very smart. She was clearly very thoughtful, and and she had this level of. I want to say I want, I don't want to say arrogance because that's a negative connotation, but she had this level of confidence that was very you know that she and the, the actress who played her rocked it, right? Like mm-hmm. I was like yes, like you know, but also like there's a there's a fantastical element for men there which is all men not all but most men want to be recognized and admired for their brilliance and yes you can there are surrogates for that people think that money equals brilliance whatever i i particularly would like to find somebody who is like you're brilliant and we're brilliant let's be brilliant together right but he was not he he as it turns out is not that brilliant right we've seen that in his contrast to gail we see that in contrast to yana um so yes, I agree with you. All that to say, these women who choose these dudes who are kind of downscale, it's it, it's a it's a it's a trope. That. They're not depicting that. So so if they had written him in a way where it's like he's so affected his his spark, right? The brilliance of what psycho history was was drawn from his wife who's now dead like i mean we could have had some brilliant writing if they understood the gender dynamic but also what can have like like what can 
lead someone to obsession in honoring the legacy of somebody that they they were in love with, which we, you know, like the Taj Mahal, right? So, which actually was the downfall, right, of that that emperor because he made this humongous mausoleum to his wife Mumtaz and which bankrupted the kingdom and eventually like his, he was supposed to make like these two mausoleums and his son was like, I'm gonna lock you up because it's too much. You did too much. Right. But it's I like the Taj Mahal. Second, right? Yeah. And, and, and so the Taj Mahal itself is like this testament, right, to love. Um, and it stands the test of time. Like people continue to go and, and look at it. But that within itself, if, if the people, like if, if they wanted to like, to say like, you know, the, the effect of Yana in his life, right, in creating the co-creating the prime radiant and saying like, yeah, you know, maybe he's like, he's just very singular in what he's trying to do um, and his obsession. But I, I just, I didn't really get that. Like, I didn't get the, like the way that he acted around her, the way that his discovery expanded, right? The compared to her self-assuredness, which was just really amazing and beautiful. Like she was like the full package and he was just kind of like, nah. And I was like, well. Right. That's, I mean, the, that's kind of what I'm getting at is that she was, you know, she had all of it. Whereas he had, he had one, a crucial and essential component, but the rest of it was like, mm. Yeah. But I would have liked to see, it's like either, you know, like the, some type, something more than just the trope of like, oh, she had my unborn child um, as the thing that connected him, like why he was so tied to her and why he was so heartbroken, which should have been her contribution to his life. That here was something that, because there are men that just really love brilliant women and what they how that woman makes them feel, but also the curiosity, the things that um, open up in their lives. So it's like, there you go. Yes. And I mean, and, and they exist. Cause I, I mean, it's like, I mean, I consider myself fairly smart and I've had people just want to be around me because they just hear me I talk enjoy about your company something enormously. Yeah. I, I and, learned something. I learned something new every day. But they didn't show that dynamic. They didn't show, they just showed Agreed. her. And, and yes, she was, beautiful naturally beautiful but for somebody as like eh, tasty as harry selden to be like you know and to not show like how they would just be like oh and we'll do this i mean there was like one little scene but it just didn't didn't like reach me and so instead it was just like bad wig bad de-aging they had all this cgi and they could have done something amazing with their courtship to show what he had lost. Like when I watch up and I know like, I mean, it's a cartoon, but like that little, like the little, it was only a few minutes in that movie where they showed their relationship and I cried. Like, I think everybody that watched that, we all, like so many people, we cried watching up to show that relationship, like a bloom. And it was like, she was just so vibrant and everything. And, um, you know, and, and why that, you know, the old man in that house, he was just so grumpy when his wife passed. That made sense. Please do writing like that, you know, really show the human, you know, like how people fall in love with somebody that's vibrant, brilliant, exciting, encouraging, show us some healthy relationships. But instead we get I, the trope of like okay. unborn child and this is my yeah. hope. And it's like, he does not seem like he's that much of a fatherly guy either. So like for right. him to be like, oh, my child. I think one of the things that I felt was, was a missed opportunity too is because these these are, these are two people who are essentially the creators of, of psychohistory. Mm-hmm. And so by that reasoning, they are both basically what you could consider prime factors. They are, they, they may not only be able to see potentially what's going to happen in the future, they may be directly causing or impacting it by their work. But I thought that it was strange that they didn't take the opportunity to somehow imply or suggest that the connection between the two of them was psychohistoric, right? In other words, it was a kind of destiny, right? Um, but it was a destiny that was layered not only in their love for each other, their their competencies, but also 
their sort of belief systems. Do you know what I mean? So it was concentric. I just was like, man, you know, like, th- like there's actually a phenomenon in the universe where there's two black holes that actually orbit each other, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it, you know, normally in that dynamic, one of the black holes eventually, through centripetal force, hurls the other one off. But there's actually a black hole that's just like, they're like, for the next 65 million years and probably forever, these two black holes are going to like, so I kind of got that feeling from that potentially, but it didn't go anywhere. So yes, I, I 100% agree. But I also want to say that that Harry's reaction to being called to recalled to Streeling or called to Streeling was totally irrational. Um, I want to sort of segue into that. He 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 basically jeopardized himself and his wife because he was being egoistic, right? He says, "Oh, it's because the you know the empire will struggle our re- will strangle our research." But the thing is, that first of all, he ended up going anyway, and he figured out how to do it, you know, do it anyway, right? So you're telling me that two people who are as smart as them, and, and let's also remember, by the way, Harry's research isn't just built upon Yana's research. It's also built upon Calais' research, right? Two women of color, right, without which, and by by the way, also eventually Gales. So three women of color who ha- who are essentially essential and prime players in the creation of psychohistory. But going back to that, I want to talk about this trope briefly, about this idea that when two, essentially in this case, white powers come into conflict, it's almost always the marginalized communities that suffer first and most. And that's what happened in this this dynamic. Definitely. I mean, for him to, I mean, he could have, he had to know that empire was very dangerous and for him to just like hold that steadfast to it without thinking about the risk to his wife that was that was wild to me um i mean i'm not sure if it completely took me out the story um i think it did a little bit where i was just kind of like you know i i I think that they were rushing to writing and and that they could have had a little bit more of like kind of them weighing things out like because she was like we got to get close to you know in there in the empire and then we could yeah and i'm like i'm like okay they would really like say this like i mean if you have like that much attention on your work that you would verbalize that in that way without thinking about like wait, we need to be somewhere where people can't hear us and hear what we're going to say, but yet we're going to be like, you know, spook who sat by the door in the empire. So, so that took me out the story. Um, So then for me to think about the rationality of that, I just felt like this was like a plot device to explain his back in, which I don't like when women of color use like that in the story. So in a lot of ways, it's like they've made Harry's wife and her tragic ending they made her like that magical colored like woman of color right she right. becomes like a vehicle for his moving his storyline forward as opposed to a character of agency with within herself and she deserves better yes i 100 percent agree with that too and i'm agreeing with you a lot these days um but i think we're on the same page with this um the other thing that i also found which feeds into this dynamic about about how, you know, this 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 planet has seen two world wars and countless other conflicts, right? And and oftentimes either either promoted or catalyzed by Western powers. And in almost every instance, uh, the people with the resources of the populations of color in the global south are the ones that have suffered. And to me, Harry's defiance of the empire sort of was an allegory for that, right? But it, it feeding into that also additionally. Is this expectation that that Western powers and and the the, the na- narrative surrogacy for white privilege, right? Is there is this expectation of restraint, right? He was being obstinate because he didn't think that the empire would dare harm him, right? But and by the way, it's no to me. It's it's. I think that it's no accident that it was a white woman who ended up dispensing that violence, right? 
I mean, it was probably an accident of writing, but I thought that it was fortuitous. It was an interesting. It was interesting. So what I guess what I'm saying is that he's like, well, I'm this white dude, and basically Empire is white. The Kleonic Empire is, you know, essentially, you know, Dynasty is white, and yeah, they'll they'll probably be angry and they'll probably get back at me in some way, but I'll probably still live. But he wasn't thinking about the lack of compunction that these power structures have when it comes to people of color. Like it didn't even occur to him. And the truth is that's how people are in real life, not just movies. So if he didn't, if if the the fact that he didn't even consider the possibility that his wife and his child might be harmed was insanity to me. Yeah. Which made me feel like, I mean, I I just felt like this was like that kind of trope. So I just had to look it up briefly. Um, Because it's like, the you know, there are TV tropes, And Mm -hmm. I suggest any writer, you look up TV tropes, you understand the kind of harmfulness of those tropes, but also just how it makes your write like lazy writing. But the, um, so there is a website um, that Gail Simone created in 1999 called Women in Refrigerators. And this is like where, um, you know, the... Um, so she was just showing like that was like a part where she was showing like how women like superhero heroines are either depowered, rape cut up or stuck in a refrigerator in order to illustrate that female superheroes are disproportionately likely to be brutalized in comics, usually to further the comic character arc of male superheroes. And so they talk about like the so they have like the stuffed in a fridge, um, also disposable women. So this is a a kind of trope of women and people of color, but I think especially like women um, are you like their deaths are used to move the story arc of a male character, and when you have a lot of that, like when you have people that I mean, this is the thing about bias in media is that it allows us to justify our actions right it allows us to yes. be used to certain ways of treating yes. individuals who are members of those communities that were targeted so say for example if you're imagining that a person of color is whose sole purpose is to be a supporting character to support your growth because all of us are the main character of our stories right and we all have aspirations for dignity and and um hopes and dreams and hurts but when you imagine that everybody else like you're the center of your universe and this is where racism and and racial superiority which there are people that have internalized superiority where they imagine that other people exist only to really serve them in some type of way and and help move their story along. And so they can operationalize those people. So that is my concern when people only see black people as serving um, a way for their development. And also like that wise, you know, the wise brown person, you know? So there are some shows where these tropes happen, the mammy, the magical Negro, but there's also like, the kind of, you know, an Asian character that serves that wisdom. Right. So that's where Harry Seldon's wife did kind of concern me where it wasn't like she was like, like, I mean, as amazing as the character was and the actress was that she like she needed to have her own story arc. Right. So yes. more backgrounds, more things fleshed Agreed. out than to be a device to show his growth, why he became so hardened and, and just, you know, and um pragmatic about what he was doing so um but the women in refrigerators is saying you know kind of i think we we have to be be aware of that a lot of writers were being influenced by other narratives and so they just they put that in there which is why we do this show why we do this podcast is because of that sorry go ahead yeah yeah so when you're writing a story right whether it's sci-fi and especially if you're doing sci-fi things like flesh out all your characters, understand that they all have all have their own motivations. There's a possibility, like what you were saying with that psycho history of like what brings people together. And it's not just a relationship, just as part of the backstory of one. And especially if you're having someone with a um, 
like if you're writing a character or casting a character that comes from the dominant culture of being mindful of how you're situating characters of color, because you may just be feeding into not just the trope, but that trope actually can lead to even further microaggressions, right? It can be like, because I can just imagine, like, I mean, this is probably happening on college campuses everywhere. And the guy's like, yeah, I watch Foundation and you're like, blah, blah, blah. I mean, but just and, think and, about and, how and, many and women's, also she, work, women's yeah. work, scientific work has been stolen and attributed to yeah. the husband often, yes. often. And yes. so this is where even that being reinforced in the, in the show, I'm like, are you kidding? Like yes. given the history of like, how the partners of scientists where they had a true partnership, but the husband takes full credit, like the woman's doing all yes. the editing, doing all the work, and and we're only finding some stuff out in the public narrative, or if you dig deep, but when we're learning this stuff in science class, we're not being taught, like, who actually yep. discovered that, or who did, and so I'm just like, why, why are we giving this all and to you, Harry Seldon, when it was his wife, his wife was the we, smarter one. This is a good segue into what I wanted to talk about, uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about. I did want to mention also real quick that I thought that it was it was also kind of cringy that he was so dismissive of her concerns about rejecting the offer. You know what I mean? Like, he, he, he didn't even consider it. He was just like, no, you're crazy. We're not doing that. And I, it was like that, you know, like, I know that it's meant to drive the story, but I would not anyway. Like I said, he he was operating from a place of sheer privilege right, at that moment. But it was you, like you, privilege, but not like what, what it would be like. So that was also, unre- I mean, so say if you have like, you know, like you're kind of a, not to say, cause he wasn't mediocre, but I mean, wife is up here and stuff. And so he could have been like, you know, you're always right, but I'm right on this. And then he's, you know, right. like maybe like right. a it little bit of nuanced. some insecurity. Right. Yeah. Like nuance that out, which would, could have given them, like a very, you know, where he's guilt and maybe his stuff is a little bit more guilt driven. Like he should have been drawn on the, on the guilt. Like he caused this, he knows his psycho right. history. And, like, and he ended together. up doing exactly what they wanted anyway. Mm-hmm. So the thing that I wanted to mention now is, is fine, finally, I, don't, I only want to spend a few minutes on this one because we're, we're over an hour at this point um, is the spacers, right? Because the spacers were in this episode. They, they've been in a few episodes, but with the exception of the very first episode, all of the spacers have appeared to be phenotypically black. And I think that there is, if this trope doesn't exist, then it should, but there is kind of a, because who, who are spacers? First of all, spacers, they, they all appear to be phenotypically black, I think, except for one that was kind of ambiguous. But their job is literally to transport goods, commerce, troops, people from point to point in the universe. So they're not only enabling commerce but they're enabling violence right like that's their job like transporting troops and stuff too and so and they and they don't and none of them have like quote unquote proper names right and that really that all bugged me for the longest time but i couldn't put my finger on it until now because like she shines bright or she you know whatever she slingshots the sun whatever her, their names are and so now i'm like it, it's it's when you when you look at for example chattel slavery for example you know, you have people who were brought here to work. They were really, literally, the backbone of this country's industry and prominence, right? They had their they had their their true names taken away from them, and and replaced with names of the choosings of the people who who enslaved them. That got me. But then, of course, as you moved away from the chattel slavery era into the Jim Crow, and then eventually, you had people who who in an effort to gain sort of acceptance in the civilization that had oppressed them, they took on these roles that were essentially essential. Like if I make myself more and more indispensable, uh, the more you know privileges and the more acceptance that I'm going to achieve. And that's, that's never happened, right? So you have people who were in the military. You have people who were in other, in, in other jobs that may have been, you know, they found they, they, had to, they were disdainful, but we did anyway because we felt that it was necessary. And so I kind of got that feel from it, if that makes sense. And the fact that they're genetically engineered, by the way, I want to, sorry, I have to say this. There's a quote uh, here, and she says, forged in servitude, right? She shines bright, forged in servitude. That's like, 
100% allegory for chattel slavery, like genetically modified chattel slavery. I'm now looking up um, I don't know I mean something about this too kind of I mean my my grandfather was a porter I mean yeah like what was the one of the few unions that black people were able to do was like in transport Bingo. being the porters um, so it has that feeling but also the first I mean Christopher Columbus like the, the first like captive um, black folks were, were, um, were Morisco, like they were Moors, like, cause they knew navigation. So they, with the astrolabe and everything. So, so it's just a very, um, there is that historical resonance, the, um, but yeah, like, I mean, and they are, you know, like the substance that they need, like they're dependent upon the substance, which leads them yes. to this permanent servitude to the to the empire um which makes me wonder is this the what harry's trying to get to like if we can stop transport then we can get to that and mind you i haven't read much much of the books outside of um the first the book. first book um so i'm trying to understand like the trans like i i have a lot of questions about the transportation system is this kind of you know, I mean, it's it's very interesting that it's taught like that. This is a kind of nuanced thing, but it, it relates to the spacing guild. Like I'm thinking about the spacing guild of Dune, where they're dependent upon spice. So when they were talking about the substance, I was like, was this just the spice? Like, you know, which I right. mean, yeah, like you need something that kind of drive the um, you know, this interstellar travel. But um, yeah, the fact that they're so important to empire to the empire and to transportation but yet they're in servitude and then now we have the um is it the horde or they're like the hot like so then i'm like is this the hive line like what is going on so they're like what are you doing here so can you yeah i was and which by the way that whole sequence was so was so um earth wind and fire afrofuturist like mm -hmm. i was like what it, like, it was i was like what is that what is that thing and then when, when the woman was like what are you doing here i was like oh my god earth wind fire gap man baby gap what's up um even though it was i, I know that they probably weren't necessarily influenced but, but yeah like i agree with the that's the point that i was driving at yes there is this level of dependency on and i think in my notes i said be subverted quotes because that's kind of how how the enslaved people in the americas were treated and I saw that connection between these spacers and 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 also this idea, like you said, the substance going back to Dune. The navigator, that, that spice is addictive, right? You're like, you're basically addicting your population to a drug for purposes of exploiting them. And granted, the navigators are different, right? But there's still an out, there's still an allegorical similarity there. Yeah, it's, it's very. Um... I mean, and they make them very beautiful, but it's like, it is that, that, um, cause you know, but they're asserting their humanity, like we're human. Um, so I'm still, but we should see that. Do you know what I mean? Like the only time we've ever seen spacers so far is when they're doing their jobs. And so, yeah, yeah we know that they're forged in servitude, quote unquote, they're genetically engineered to be spacers, but I also want to know. What are they doing when they're not transporting stuff? You know, like, I do want to know that. I want to know that they're like, did they, you know, because there are people who were, in ancient times, there were people who were, quote unquote, slaves, but they still occupied positions of, you know, authority or power within certain societies. You know, so if you're going to run with that enslaved narrative, I want to know that they're not necessarily chattel slaves. I want to know something else about them. And if you're going to make that your case or you're going to make that your story, I want to know why. Yeah. So, so one of my um, subfields is like, it was actually that I was actually kind of specialized in was like slavery and, um, you know, and it was like in a more like pre-modern, but also goes up into the modern world. But like, so the basic thing that really like separates a huge, like a free person from an enslaved person 
um, is that they um, um, someone that is enslaved does not have control over their biological, like their offspring. Um, so like, say if you have like, um, um, you know, cause like they, and they existed in all ranks of society and, and, and proximity to power and having power. And so like chattel slavery was like when they were just like no rights whatsoever. But yet when it comes to like, um, like in many societies or like within African society and Muslim society, right. It's like that, um, that if, um, an enslaved person is like the actual, like the, the, that their children, as long as they're in that status of being a slave, like that their children's fate is actually really controlled by the, the person that technically owns them. Um, even though they have limitations on what could be done to that person. Um, there are some complexities, so I think like Keisha Ali like talks about that, like with concubinage, but also like mm -hmm. with Ottomans, like, like, cause Ottoman means like slaves, like the slaves of the Sultan Uthman, like, like Uthmania. So, and they utilize that system, like they call it the Dev, Dev Shirme system. So they would have levy on boys, like, or children even like, you know, we want like, so villages in, in Eastern Europe and Russia, and, you know, like these regions would have to have like a levy on the amount of children that they would send. And these children would actually be conscripted into different levels of the army and be close to the, to the, to the Sultan. And this way, like that, because they were enslaved, like they had no ties to any family or power. And that's how a lot of like empires would actually, that's why they would use slaves and serve like servants. Like they would actually take them away from their families in the ideal, like would not have that contact, but what we could see, like even in, um, the book that you're working on, which is like on, on the Count of Monte Cristo, that even that those, a lot of times the, ch the Christian children that were levied, they would still have some contact. They would find ways to contact their Christian family and still have some ties in that. Cause you can see that with like Haiti in, um, in the Count of Monte Cristo. So, so yeah, like enslavement, is very complex and so i'm interested to not to say like i'm i'm interested to see like how they're gonna do do that you know and yes and to draw out the metaphor of servitude like permanent servitude and what does that look like of getting free um but also adding some nuance so i'm i'm interested to see like you know are there ways to talk about permanent servitude in a way that does it justice without minimizing you know, the harm that exists, whether that's an Ottoman empire or any other type of empire where people don't have their full freedom as full, you know, like just their full autonomy, whether that's like with their own bodies, with their own children, with their own wealth, like those are all things. It's a, it's definitely a hardship. So I'm not trying to minimize that. Like oh, there's some people I would never, that I do that, yeah. but it's, 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 I mean, they've they already set the stage for, foundation potentially becoming a new empire so this idea mm -hmm. that they're seeking out these spacers in order to, to because one of the necessary components of resistance is going to be ftl right they, they have mm -hmm. to have it they're, they're never going to be able to to defend each other if they if they have to rely on, on conventional means of travel so mm -hmm. i can see that they're going to be i can see potentially that these this giant spacer ship is going to be an element of that there maybe they're exiles or something but on the other hand, what I see potentially is this possibility of trading one form of servitude for another, right? Which is, which is, you know, you're you're pursuing the promise of freedom, and you end up falling into this pitfall of more more servitude. So, and I think that I think that that forged in servitude thing kind of also is a little bit of foreshadowing. Yeah. If, if... Yeah, that framing, and I was like, what, you know, and then, but also this idea wild. of like, the souls of like, so then the other part was like the souls of black folks, where it's like, they have this idea, like, we're just like, more spiritual than other people, like, we're somehow like transcendent. So therefore, and we serve this purpose, right, of carrying burdens for people and helping them on their journeys. Like, I'm yes. like, like, I'm like, well, what is, what is it? Like they should exist for their own needs. Like we transcended because we love this. We love right. space. And 
And to right. do this, you know, we, we have this field here. Like I, it's just, um, I wanted to, I wanted, I wanted to mention, cause you go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just like, you know, cause you know, I have those moments where I'm like, ah, <laughs> I, I read the the book Disordered Com- Cosmos by um by Chanda Prescott Weinstein, and there was one part of the book that I found particularly interesting, which is that um that there is a correlation between melanin and quantum phenomena. There's a positive correlation, and which I've used to like I'm, I've been using that idea to write stories. And the, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, faster than light travel is a quantum phenomenon. Gail talks about that in the very first episode. She talks about, you know, ab- about that. And so, I, I, like, it, it would have been so cool if they were like, there is this, this, this predisposition in, in black folks, right, for, you know, for physical interaction with quantum phenomenon, right? Like entanglement or, 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 or quantum tunneling. Obviously, anybody who watches the show who's not you know, black or person of color would have immediately been like, that's reverse racism. But it still could have, it still could have justified to some degree, not justified, but it would have been an interesting explanation for why most of the spacers appear to be people of color. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely need to read the book. I mean, I'm definitely, I mean, because when you think about melanin and brown, right? Like, I mean, in, Look it up. Brown does not exist. There's no light color brown. There's brown does not exist yet. Melanin. So it's like you see it right, and it's this powerful right. effect. So next week, let's let's make sure we you know we go into brown and melanin. I think that should okay. be on our science we'll roundup. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, we're gonna have. Well, we we're gonna have a also. I, I will do some research on that, but we're gonna have a a brown actress that we're going to be discussing at length over the next several weeks, starting next week, um, Rosario Dawson. So that's going to be a fun episode. And I want to bring this episode to a close by reminding everybody that um, Marguerite is the head of executive director for Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative. Please go and check out their social media. Please go and check out their website. Um, there's a lot of interesting and wonderful things happening this uh, this autumn. Please check out Fresh Pulp Magazine also. We've got some articles going up soon. Marguerite recently did an article for us on the hidden black roots of Dune. So absolutely go check that out. It's a fantastic article, wonderful scholarship. Um, and also please check out our tip button, shoot us some ducats, check out our wish list. We love it. So thank you very much, Marguerite. Thank you again, once again, for doing this with me. I really enjoyed talking with you on Saturday afternoon. I will see you next week. I will see everyone next week.